Hey, what's up everyone? So, if you've been following the news around Swift, you know that the hype of the moment is the new async await feature. But you might also know that this feature is only available on iOS 15. So for the vast majority of us that still have to support earlier version of iOS, it's actually going to be one or two more years before we can actually start using the feature in our apps. And that's why for this video, I wanted to focus on an actually already existing function that lets us, well, execute code in parallel quite easily. And as you're going to see, even though this function is there for quite some time in Swift, it's not necessarily that well known and I think it has a lot to do with its naming. But as always, before I show you the solution, I've got to set up the problem first. So let me start by pasting in some code. So as you can see, I have pasted one line of code and this line, well, we could say it simulates a situation in Swift where we have a large amount of data. So here an array of 10,000 elements, and then we want to iterate on this array. And for each of the elements, we want to execute a computation that will be quite costly. Here, we are going to want to sum all of the integers up to the element. So it's going to be a costly computation that is made a big number of time. And as you can imagine, when I'm going to run this code, it's actually going to take quite some time to complete. And before I run the code, I'm actually going to add some extra lines in order to be able to measure the time that the code takes to execute. So first, I'm going to store the time before we run the code, and then also the time just after the code has completed its execution. And finally, using the difference between the end and the start, I'm going to be able to display the time that it took to run my code. A little side note here, using dates to measure code performance is not the best way to do it because it's not, we could say, the most precise. But as you're going to see in this case, the execution time is going to be measured in a number of seconds. And so where you are on the scale of seconds, I think it's precise enough. But if someday you need to exactly measure the time that your code is taking to run, maybe in number of microseconds, don't use a date because it's not precise enough. Okay, enough being said, now let me just run the code and see how long it takes to complete. And as you can see, it took quite some time because it almost took 20 seconds, which is of course a lot of time. And when we take a look at this code, well, we can see that there is a lot of room for optimization because all of this computation here, well, they could all be made in parallel. There is no reason for them to happen all on the same thread. So what we're going to want to do is to actually implement what we could call a parallel for each. So a version of for each where each iteration can be executed in parallel if there is enough threads available. So let's actually go ahead and implement together this parallel for each function. So as you can see, I have pasted some more code. So I have pasted an extension of array and you can see I have written the signature of this parallel for each method. And as you can see, the signature is actually the same than the existing for each, meaning that it takes a body that will be called for every element in the array. Now, how do we actually make it so that the body can be executed on several threads in parallel. Well, this is where we are going to use the function I was talking about in the intro, which is called concurrent perform. So it's a function that is declared on dispatch queue. It's a static function called concurrent perform. As you can see, it takes two arguments. The first one is the number of iterations and the second one is the closure to execute for each iteration. So in our case, the number of iteration is easy. It's actually the count of the array because we want to iterate over all of the elements of the array. Then we're going to have our closure. So this closure, it's taking as its argument a number that says which iteration it is. So we're going to be able to use this number in order to subscript our array. So inside, what we can do is that we can get the current element by subscribing self, which is the array, using this variable i. And then what we can do is that we can call the body, passing as its argument, well, the result of this expression. And that's actually it. We have implemented our parallel for each method. So as you can see, this method concurrent perform is quite easy to implement. You just need to give it the number of iterations that you want to have, and then it will call the closure that number of time and the function will take care of executing this closure on the maximum number of threads possible at the same time. The function is also going to take care of synchronizing all the threads because this function will not return until all of the iterations have indeed been executed. So now let's actually try to use this function. So since the signature is the same, then for each I just have to copy the name and 
paste it here. So as you can see, the code still builds. And now I'm going to run my code and we're going to see how faster it is after the modification. So as you can see, this time it ran much faster because it took only a little bit more than three seconds. And when you compare it to almost 20 seconds just before, you can see that indeed there has been a dramatic increase in performance. So this sounds super cool, but as always, whenever we introduce an optimization, it's always a matter of trade-off. So should you use this parallel for each every time and never use for each again? Of course, the answer is no. You only want to use this parallel version of for each when there is enough iteration for it to actually make sense. And to have an idea when it actually makes sense to use this version, well, you can read the documentation of concurrent perform because in the documentation, it says that you should use this function when the number of iteration is at least three times more than the number of cores available on the device that your code is running on. So for instance, if your device has four cores, well, you should not use concurrent perform if you are planning to make less than 12 iteration. And it makes sense because calling concurrent perform, well, there is an overhead because this function has to work with threads. It has to synchronize the execution. And so you only want to call this method when there will be enough iteration so that it will compensate this overhead. So my advice for you after watching this video is to take a look in your apps and think, well, is there a place where you are actually iterating over a large amount of data to perform a large amount of work in each iteration. And if that's the case, well, I can only recommend that you try to use parallel for each or any other flavor of using dispatch queue concurrent perform, because as you can imagine here, I have implemented a parallel for each because, well, it's the most simple to implement, but we could also just as easily implement a parallel map or a parallel flat map, for instance. And so if you have such an instance where it makes sense to introduce a parallel version of the existing method, well, you can actually try to do it as we've seen it's not that long to make the code work. And once you have it, well, you can measure the performance and you can see if it can actually help make your code faster. One last piece of advice before we end, I want you to also take notice that of course, well, whenever we run code in parallel, we must make sure that our code is indeed compatible with running in parallel, meaning that our code won't generate any data race, for instance. Here, that's the case because in my for each, well, I am not manipulating any global state, but of course, if I was reading or writing from a global state, it would be an issue. And then introducing parallelism would probably create some bugs in my codes. So that's also something that you need to pay attention for. And now this time, that's it. That's the end of the video. Thank you for watching it and see you next time.